coming. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you for this uh, coming to this final final press conference by His Excellency Mons Lukatoft, the president of the 70th session of the UN General Assembly, uh, the e session ending uh, today. Um, you're also welcome to, to come and cover the handover ceremony at 3 o'clock in the General Assembly Hall, followed immediately by a stakeout by the new president of the General Assembly uh, of the 71st session, His Excellency Peter Thompson. Uh, Mr. Thompson will be the first president to take an oath of office uh, uh, this afternoon. He'll also be uh, flanked by his his family for that. So please, uh, please come along uh, to see that. But without further ado, let me hand over to the, the current president, uh, His Excellency Mons Lukatoft, sir. Thank you, Dan. And thank you for all of you to come forward to this last meeting with the press corps here at the UN. Uh, I will, of course, in my closing statement uh, this afternoon uh, at three o'clock try to give an overall assessment of the year we have uh, been through under my presidency. But what I wanted to inform you on in particular is, well, you may be aware that we just adopted the revitalization uh, uh, resolution a few minutes ago. Uh, I hammered that through, uh, and uh, what we have now is a quite new uh, code of conduct uh, as uh, an oath uh, for the next president and, and all the transparency we have worked for also on the issue of the office of the president of the General Assembly. But in particular, I want to inform you that this morning I uh, sent a letter to the President of the Security Council and another letter to the incoming President, Peter Thompson, uh, with copy to all member states, uh, where we have tried to resume the considerations, observations on the process of uh, transparency in the selection of the next Secretary General. Uh, I think that this new standard should be seen as a bar, not the ceiling, and should be maintained throughout the in entirety of, of the selection of the appointment process. That's also the reason why I uh, repeatedly have had some critical remarks on the a presumed lack of transparency in what the Security Council does in, in its uh, straw polls. I mean, it's not a, a big issue because you are so quickly able to get uh, hold on the outcomes of the straw polls, so we all know about it, but I, th I think it would have been uh, more in line with the transparency we have fought for in the General Assembly if it also formally had been a uh, transparent process in the Security Council. I mean, when we go forward, uh, it may be worth considering how to establish uh, such an exercise or exploring ways to ensure that uh, the membership's own assessments of candidates can be fed into the se selection of, 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 of the process in the Council. It's still a very clear expectation that any additional candidate that may appear subsequent to the joint circulation of the letter presenting the, uh, the candidate should participate in the General Assembly informal dialogue as the first step prior to being included in the considerations of the Security Council. This has been the understanding also all along the way uh, between me and the President of the Security Council. Uh, on the, the rest of the process leading forward to the selection of the next SG, uh, it, there has been a call among 
part of the membership at least to appoint co-facilitators on the General Assembly resolution on the Security Council's appointment, uh, uh, of the Secretary General appointment, uh, well before the, uh, the Council reaches its decision on a recommendation. I understand that that's not a demand that popular with some of the council members, but in my view, it's entirely consistent with the spirit of transparency and inclusivity of the process we have followed up until now. But let me add to that any uh, consideration of appointing uh, co-facilitators for this process uh, will, I hope, also will be with the purpose of, reach a of, of reaching a consensus appointment resolution. That, 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 that's about the content of the letters uh, uh, distributed this morning. And uh, if you haven't got it, you can get a copy of, of, of those letters, which is kind of my and uh, my office's reflection on, on what we have done up till now and what should be considered in the, the uh, rest of the process. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the candidates, uh, whether you're uh, still expecting anybody to uh, jump in the race. And also, uh, everybody, it's like there is a common knowledge a given knowledge that in the end it is the United States of America and Russia who are going to decide who is going to be the next uh, Secretary General. And I, my question whether is whether this is what's happening, the transparency issue is just a political ploy or what's your, I don't know, what are you going to do in order to prevent this uh, such a outcome. Is anybody also withdrawing? Uh, thank you. It's a very good question, but I think the answer is two things. Of course, the permanent members of the Security Council have a very important influence on the outcome. We can't change that. That's, so to say, embodied in the Charter of the United Nations. But I think that the consequence of the process we, for the first time, have established is that they are bound to listen much more to the recommendations and preferences also more informally expressed by the general membership but also by the directly by the General Assembly elected members of the Security Council. I still insist on this feeling that this has been a game-changing process uh, and that it has come there to stay, that there is only established a list of candidates for consideration in the Security Council through the presentations in the General Assembly. And that has given the members of the General Assembly a much, and the broader global public a much, much better insight in the personalities and the priorities of the candidates than ever before. And that I am sure also the permanent five will be influenced at least through the friends of them in this great assembly. A question here, and then we'll go uh, over there. Uh, Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press. Um, based on the reports that we've seen of the straw poll so far and Ms. Figueroa's withdrawal, uh, what is your um, reaction to the fact that none of the uh, women uh, who came forward as candidates appear to be near the top uh, of these straw polls? Um, some have criticized that and, and said that the UN is not living up to its professed uh, uh, standard that it proclaims to the rest of the world about gender equality. So that's the first question. The second one, if you care to answer it, is can you share with us any of your own plans uh, going forward? 
af after your term as president um, expires? <laughs> Do you turn to return to um, some sort of a political uh, future? Uh, thank you. Well, uh, I, I will only, on the first question, I will only si uh, say it has been a surprise for me, as I think it has been for many others, that the female candidates haven't done better in the straw polls up till now, because we have had this very huge conversation about the possibility of getting the first ever female secretary general. But, 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 but as we have, I think also in this uh, audience, we have talked about it before. There are no rules and regulations whatsoever uh, in the United Nations about gender or geographical uh, rotation. It's only what the membership will decide uh, and what traditions the membership uh, wants to maintain or not want to maintain. On my 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 own future, my I I, I was. Uh, the same week last June 2015, when I was el uh, uh, elected president f uh, for the 70th session, I was re-elected for the 12th time as member of the Danish parliament and got on leave and went over here. But I will return on the 1st of October as a member of the Danish parliament. And I think I will uh, use last part of my energy on the issues I've been working with over here on sustainable development and climate, on, on peace and security, also from the Danish political platform. But also, I can see now already in my agenda by going a little bit around in the world and talking about these issues as well. In the light of um, John Ash's scandal, there were a series of recommendations made to the Office of the Presidency of the General uh, Assembly about um, uh, how to manage financial donations and mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. I'm wondering if you could give us an update of what was implemented and what was changed or where things stand uh, in that front. I can do that, but 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 I think uh, the, the, the general comment on that uh, well, you can read it all in the resolution we just passed 20 minutes ago, uh, or something like that. Uh, and it lives up to all the requirements we have tried to raise for our own office of the PGA and mm -hmm. the present PGA uh, as our self-imposed practices of transparency. And it includes also as a quite new thing, Dan mentioned at the beginning, the oath of the President of the General Assembly, which Peter Thompson will take uh, on him uh, this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, but, but all the requirements for transparency on, on the issues of, of economy and uh, uh, trust fund, whatever, yeah. travels, is there now. And hopefully that can also be an inspiration for other parts of the UN system. Thank you, President Likitoft. Uh, Sherman Bryceby, South African Broadcasting. A final press conference by an out outgoing uh, President of the General Assembly wouldn't be complete without a question on UN reform and particularly Security Council reform, so allow me to oblige. Uh, why has this process, particularly Security Council reform, lacked the, the levels of urgency we saw around uh, the, achieving the Paris Climate Change Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, which d show us that member states can come together and agree on a set of principles. Why is this process so untenable? Why are we not making any progress? And please char 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 characterize for us the, the intergovernmental negotiations around this issue. I will make some additional comments on that specific issue also in my closing remarks this afternoon, but I, I, can, I can tell you that I feel personally the same kind of impatience with these intergovernment negotiations as you express. But, I mean, we have to realize that when it has been moving so slowly over the last couple of decades and not co uh, uh, led forward to a result yet, it's because it takes a two-third majority that's stipulated in the Charter. It takes a two-third majority in the General Assembly and the ratification among the present permanent five 
to change anything about the Security Council. And I, I think most people realize how much of a cash 22 that is. Uh, uh, but what has happened over this year, I think, is still uh, some small but important steps forward. There is an, a realization that we need a Security Council reform so that the Council is enlarged and better reflect the geopolitical realities of the 21st century, one. But the questions of more permanent members and veto has, for the reasons I mentioned first, been very, very difficult. And I don't think that there will be a reform of the Security Council before at least two-thirds of the member states come together, not on wishing reform, but on a particular model, and engage with the present permanent five and how to, to do it. And there are, there are good sketches around for compromise models, but nobody has been really willing to make a compromise yet. Uh, I mean, the elders, Kofi Annan and, and associates, have brought forward ideas and so on and so forth. Mm. But you need the large majority of the member states of this organization to come together on a particular model as the first necessary step for moving this process to an end. Pamela and then uh, Evelyn. Uh, Mr. PGA, for during your um, term in office. Uh, thank you for the final press conference. It's Pamela Falk from CBS News. Uh, my question is about what you talked about in the very beginning uh, today on the transparency being uh, should be what you've done thus far should be the floor, not the ceiling. I, one of the things was the straw polls. There were was some discussion, and you've discussed this, about sending more candidates out to the General Assembly after the debate that you sponsored, all that you did, candidates are vetted by the General Assembly and then it's up to the Security Council. Why do you think, and I've heard you say, you think it might be too divisive, explain why not send more candidates to the GA? Thank you. Well, there are a number of member states that have called for more candidates from the Security Council. Mm, and uh, that may happen at some point. I don't think it will happen this time. But, 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 but my personal impression, or my personal feelings around this issue is that it is something of a balance. It's much better that the membership expresses its views before the process starts in the Security Council. And maybe in a future uh, situation, we will come to that there is a mandate for the, uh, by the, the General Assembly, for the General Assembly, to make its own straw polls, which will be influential uh, on, on the process, uh, the charter uh, established process in the Security Council. But, but the problem of bringing more candidates forward at the very end is that if it's a very split vote, it will initially undermine the authority of the Secretary General. And, and, and what we need, at least, is a very strong authority behind the Secretary General of independence and moral uh, impact on, on the membership. Thank you for the briefing. Evelyn Leopold, Huffington Post contributor. I came in late, so you might have spoken to this point, but the way the results are released from the straw poll seem to be rather peculiar that they don't announce them since we get them anyway, and they're all over Twitter and Facebook and whatnot. And secondly, do you believe, I don't know if you can speak to this, but do you believe Russia would allow anyone, uh, would veto anyone who was not from Eastern Europe? The last question, I really don't know. I haven't heard of any expression from any of the permanent five about their intentions to make vetoes. I haven't heard, but, but there may be such extensions, uh, intentions, I don't know. Uh, on, on the procedure in the Security Council, I think 
I, I, I commented on, the, on that as I <laughs> have been used to do <laughs> over the every store poll now. Uh, I, I think it would be more in line with the transparency process is it will, if it was published by the Security Council itself. I mean, it's a little odd that last time uh, the president of the, of the Security Council didn't even have the opportunity to phone me that it had taken place before I knew the result from you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ibtisam Azim from Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper, um, Daily Pan Arab newspaper. I have uh, a question. You talked about the fact that you need two third uh, majority in the Secretary General in the um, General, General Assembly to change anything, etc. Where do you see the role of? Uh, two people, the, gener the Secretary General, the next Secretary General to do so, or to try to um, uh, like to go more steps farther in this direction, and the uh, uh, next President of the GA, which recommendation would you give him or um, for his next year? Thank you. I think that any Secretary General and any President of General Assembly would, would, would love to facilitate uh, or support a process, but I think that we have to respect that the member states have insisted that this reform discussion is an intergovernmental uh, negotiation. Uh, and I, I, we have not, I think, neither the Secretary General nor me or nor earlier presidents have been uh, asked to take special initiatives from the membership on, on this except, of course, for the rollover resolution on the work that has been done in the General Assembly mm. in, in each particular year. So it's a, it's a delicate balance between, I think we all would want to push something forward, but, but the membership has to decide by itself uh, which role they want a Secretary General or a President to have in this process, if any. Terrific. I think that's all we've got time for. The noon briefing's about to start. So thank you very much indeed for coming to this, the final press conference of the 70th session and the President uh, of the General Assembly, Mons Lukatov. Thank you.